Jesus. Merry Christmas, everybody. Let's worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and give him glory as we sing joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let us receive the King. Let every heart prepare room and heaven and nature sing and heaven and nature sing and heaven and heaven and nature sing joy to the world the savior reigns let men their songs employ while fields and floods rocks hills and plains repeat the sound in joy Repeat the sound in joy. Repeat, repeat the sound. He rules the world. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. And wonders of his love, and wonders, wonders. No more let sin, no more let sin and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found, far as the curse is found. He rules the world, he rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love. And wonders, wonders are No more let sin, no more let sin And sorrows grow No thorns infest the ground He comes to make his blessings flow Far as the curse is found Far as the curse is found Far as, far as Joy to the world, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Glory to God. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing all the plains and the mountains in reply, echoing their joyous strains. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er the plains And the mountains in reply Echoing their joyous strength Yes, 
Christ, the Lord, the newborn King. it in three capsules, if I may put it that way. Christmas tells us that God remembers and keeps his word. Secondly, Christmas tells us that God honors his word. And thirdly, Christmas tells us that God delivers that which he promises in his word. But having the program today and then tomorrow, sorry, next Sunday is Christmas Eve. And we have our Christmas morning service next week, Sunday. So there will be no Christmas morning service as that. So I have to cut the whole thing out and decide how I can actually splice it in. So you bear with me this morning. And we we'll maybe, if we go over a little about 10 minutes or so, it wouldn't hurt you. But I promise you, we will be out of here by the latest about quarter to 11. There about. That sound good to you? That, that gives me just about 20 minutes, isn't it? 20, half an hour? Anyway. Anyway, I'm going to take half an hour. Put, put it that way. <laughs> I'm going to take half an hour. Yeah. So let me try to do the first part. What does Christmas tell us? Number one, part one. It tells us that God remembers and honors his word. Turn with me please to the book of Genesis chapter 3. I know in our experiences in serving God, some of us have to ask ourselves, has God really changed his mind? Does he still hold to what he promises? Because if you have not yet done so, the time will come when there might be some circumstances that will develop in your experience that will make you really question if God still means all that he ever says. And that is important. So let me look at the book of Genesis chapter 3 and verses 14 and 15. And hear what we are talking about there. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. 
And then he goes on to tell him, to tell the, the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between her seed and your seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, we begin there, because the whole concept of redemption that resulted in the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, it found a genesis right there in Genesis chapter 3. And we need to understand that. When man sinned against God, God was not caught in a trap. He didn't have to think. What was the way out? Matter of fact, when the Lord came and was looking for Adam and Eve and they confessed that they were afraid because they heard the voice of God, God did not have to go home or someplace where he lived and come back after seven days and say, well, I have a plan now. God instantly told the devil what his future plan was going to be. He said, look, man, I'm going to put enmity, enmity rather, between you and the woman. You are going to bruise his heel, but he's going to bruise your head. In other words, God, right over there, made it quite clear that he had the situation under control, and he knew just what he would do. And that is wonderful. So the whole plan, the whole concept came out of that incident in the garden of Eden, where man rejected, and it may sound like a hard word, but it's true, that man rejected the perfect plan of God. God and allow himself to be deceived by the evil one, the devil. Now, as you understand, when God made that promise to the devil, and the bottom line of the promise was, there is going to be an answer, there is going to be a solution. What you have done, Satan, I have a plan just to counteract that. I have a plan just to defeat that. So what did God have to do? God decided that he will bring together a people. But that people we are talking about will have a man. So we come to a point called the Abrahamic covenant, which is the fourth covenant and the covenant of promise. You find there in chapter 12 and also chapter 17 of the book of Genesis. I'm going a little bit fast here to give you the bottom line. And so the covenant of Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, of God making it quite clear that out of that arrangement, there will come a Savior. There will come a Redeemer to undo what the devil has done. To bring man back into a proper relationship with himself. And so the Abrahamic covenant covered about 430 years starting with Abraham onto the exodus out of the land of Egypt where they were in bondage for 430 years. Are you following me? And so it is very, very crucial to us to understand that God had a target. That's why let me jump the gun a little bit here. That's why Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 says, when the fullness of the time was come, and I, I like that. 
Because here we have all the time, for centuries, God was in no hurry. What is important is that the people to whom God spoke and to whom he revealed his covenant will have the patience. That's why we are told in the book of Hebrews chapter 6, I think from verse 11, 12, 13, 14, there about, come wrong there. And the Bible says that when God made promise to Abraham, he told him, in blessing I will bless you, in multiplying I will multiply you. And the Bible goes on to say that after he had patiently endured, he reaped the promise. In other words, what God had promised, nobody was going to make him jump with nervousness and do it before the time was ripe or appropriate. So the Bible says, and after he had endured patiently. So when God made promise to Abraham, Galatians chapter 4 also said that God did not use plurality. He did not say seeds out of many but seed as of one, and that one was Christ. So when God was speaking to the devil in the form of the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, the person whom God had in mind was the Lord Jesus Christ. It was not Isaac. It was not Jacob. It was not Isaiah. It was Christ. When God made promise to Abraham, he did not say seeds, but he said seed as of one, and that one seed was Christ. Now, it is very, very significant that when we look at the time when the promise was fulfilled, and now, we are in 2023, 2,023 years have passed. And we ask ourselves, what is God waiting for? How many people must die before he comes back? But remember, it is going to happen when? When the fullness of the time is come. In the meantime, we the people of God need to have patience. Need to have faith. So God, after 430 years, he bringing Israel out of bondage. You can imagine the celebration and the joy and the wonderful time of, I mean, happiness, and, I mean, joyfulness coming out of that bondage after 430 years. And God, by his miraculous power, wrought signs and wonders in the life and the experiences of the people of Israel. But let's look at the book of Exodus chapter 32. An incident happened there. The people whom God brought out have come to a point where they couldn't understand the purpose of God or the works of God or the ways of God, rather. And God was on the brink of bringing the people into a new relationship, into a new experience with himself. Because he had called Moses up on the mountain, remember that? And he's going to spend 40 days and nights up there receiving a new mandate. The God was going to be among them. They didn't have to wait upon Moses anymore to tell them what God is saying. They were going to be having the presence of God 24-7. And after a short while... 40 days, not too long, they told Aaron, we don't know what has become of this man called Moses. We are tired of waiting. And by the way, 
they were in no doubt where Moses had gone. They saw the glory of God. They saw the splendor. They heard the voice of God. And they knew that God was there on the mountain, symbolically speaking. And they saw when the cloud came and covered Moses. So they had no excuse. And they rebelled and asked Aaron to make them a god that can go before them. And that's the backdrop. Look at Exodus chapter 32. They can't wait upon God any longer. And here we have in verse 11 or verse 7 there about. And the Lord said to Moses, Get thee down from the people, for the people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. And they have turned aside quickly out of the way. God said, they turned what? what? Quickly. It's no length of time. In such a, like, like the winking of the eyelashes, they have turned themselves quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Anyhow, let's make a little jump here. So God is telling Moses, I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to get rid of them. And then Moses decided to have a little talk with God. <laughs> I like Moses. I like him. Moses is preaching a message to God. The first man who ever preached to God was Moses. According to God's word. Exodus chapter 32. And verse 11 now. And Moses besought the Lord as God and said, Lord, why does your wrath work so hot against thy people? With thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, etc. Now there are three things that God had to be reminded of. God wanted to wipe them out. God wanted to get rid of them completely. And Moses said, no God, you can't do that. Because number one, when you wipe them out, you are going to give the enemy occasion to blaspheme against your name. The Egyptians are going to say that you have destroyed them because you didn't have the answer. Look at verse 12. That's what the enemy will say. You're going to play right into the hand of the enemy. You're going to give them occasion to blaspheme your name. That's in verse 12. And he said, secondly, God, you have an obligation to a people. That, that verse 13. You brought them out. They did not beg you. You brought them out with power and might. And the most important point is this. He said, God... What will you do to remember the covenant that you made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? You have a covenant to protect. You have a covenant to preserve. And that is so very important. Moses had, remind, had to remind God, you are going to play in the hand of the Egyptians and you will not be able to doubt what they're saying is true, then you have an obligation to the people, and then you have a covenant. 
that you made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what will become of all that? You have in verse 13 a covenant to preserve. Now, if you look at Je Hebrew chapter 6 and verse 13, he said, When God made covenant to Abraham, he said, Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. So Moses is reminding God, you can't take this thing lightly, God. Let's forget the first two things. You have a covenant. And there's a record where God says, my covenant will I not break? No, all the thing that goes out of my mouth. And the Bible says in verse 14, Of chapter 32. Now let me take a verse 13 for example. The Lord is reminded. He said remember Abraham. I like that. He said, remember. Let me put to you. He said God lest you forget. Remember. And I want you to underline that word. It is powerful. Remember Abraham. So Moses called upon God to remember. What does Hebrew chapter 6 say? Let me see, refresh my memory. Hebrew chapter 6 and verse what, 13? Yeah, I think it is. Hebrew 6:13. For when God made promise to Abraham, yes, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. If there were a greater name than the name of God, God would have sworn by that name. But because there's no greater, God swear by himself. Multiply, I'll multiply you. Etc. Now, to make a long thing short, after Moses was done lecturing to God, the Bible said the Lord repented. It said the Lord repented. He remembered what he said. He realized that what Moses was saying made a lot of sense. And God, we say, he backed down. You're going to observe, from that day onward, God took that as a guideline. He took it as a guideline. I make some notes here after I have given that to the folk to type out. And because the thing seems so important, you're going to observe from that time on everything that God did. He did because he remembered. I wanted to sink in. Subsequent to that, everything that God did, he did because he remembered. It became like the policy, it became like the guideline. That was going to guide God as to how he ought to conduct himself, how he ought to behave. For example, let me give you an example here. In Exodus chapter 2 and verse 24, 24 rather, he said, God remembered the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's Exodus 2 and verse 24. Exodus 6 and verse 5. I have remembered my covenant. Leviticus chapter 6 and verse 42. Then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. You have thought that God is going backward now? <laughs> Abraham was the first one, then Isaac. But God did not with Jacob, Isaac, and Abraham. He went from the last to the first. Fourthly, 
In Psalm 98 and verse 3, God said, He hath remembered his mercy and is true toward his house of Israel. Psalm 105 and verse 42, He remembered his holy promise and Abraham his servant. And Psalm 106 and verse 45, And he remembered for them his covenant. The point is this, that that became like the operating principle after that little bit of confusion in Exodus chapter 32. What is it about? God is re-emphasizing. He will remember. He will remember. But I want to admit to you that the time it will seem to us like if God does not remember. Am I talking sense? If you have not yet experienced it, you will sometime. As long as you're upon the face of the earth, there are some things that you will not be able to understand. It will confuse you. And the best of us will have to learn to put our feet down and depend upon the faithfulness of God. Depend upon the integrity of God. That God is good. That God is faithful. Let's turn to Psalm 77. And go through a few verses there. Psalm 77. And I'll read that thing from verse 7. Let me take from verse 6. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I stop there. I call to remembrance my song in the night. What the psalmist is saying. There are pleasant memories I have when in the night season and all the day long I sang a song. You remember that song? In the night season and all the day long. There's a time when maybe I could not sleep, he's saying. And when I lay on my bed and think of the goodness of God, the only songs of praise that well up into my spirit, I encouraged myself. I remember when I got saved, one of the first scriptures I learned, I began to learn the scripture, and it is Psalm 4 and verse 4. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your heart upon your bed and be still. I never forgot that psalm, 4, four and verse 4. For when you can't sleep sometime and you lie there to upset wandering thoughts and all type of godless thoughts may come to your mind, you are cause a song in the night season. You're alone by yourself. You search your heart. You know you are right with God. And out of that consciousness, a song of praise that comes out. When nothing seems to make sense. And the psalmist is saying, I call to remember my song in the night. When I was alone with myself. When there was nobody to counsel or to give me advice. I had a song. I communed with my own heart. And my spirit made diligent search. The time when you allow yourself to allow the source light of God's word to come into your spirit. And you say, God, I know that you are real. 
in spite of what is happening, I know you are real. In spite of my understanding, not being enlightened, I know that you are real. And the song comes out. Like Paul and Silas at midnight, they sang praises unto God. Hallelujah. But the psalmist goes on to say, next verse, will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Have you ever come to a point in your life? You say, God, I have prayed. I've called upon your name. I've confessed the word. I've made positive confessions. I've waited. I have waited upon you. God, are you not going to be favorable anymore? Have you forgotten to be merciful? Will you cast off forever? Are you going to turn your back against me forever, God? Are you going to become so angry that you have no time to hear me anymore? And in this, beloved, is the cry of a soul that has to remind itself that God has not forgotten to be favorable. God has not cast you off. God has not forgotten you. And he cries out. Next verse. Is his mercy clean gone forever? Does his promise fail forevermore? <laughs> I know some of you can't maybe relate to that. You quote every promise of God based upon his word, based upon his integrity, based upon his faithfulness, based upon his compassion, based upon his glorious sympathy. And he said, have all that failed have I come to a point where I can't depend upon your promise anymore? When I can't say God said so anymore? And we, beloved, in some time in our life, we'll find ourselves coming to a point where we begin to question the thing we have always believed. The thing we have always lived by. The enemy will come in and cause you to question that. But God can take care of himself. He said to them at one time, can a mother forget her suckling child? He said, yes, she may forget, but I will never forget you. <laughs> I will never forsake you. A mother with the tenderness and the love looking down into a child's eyes and the child looking up into a mother's eyes. He said, the possibility exists. A mother may forget. But the God has said, I will not forget you. I will not forever, forever. I will not cast you off. Let no question arise in your mind. Because why? I remember. <laughs> I will not forget you. God has not forgotten to be faithful. He has not forgotten to be merciful. He said, I will remember my covenant with Abraham. I will remember my covenant with Isaac. I will remember my covenant with Jacob. I will remember. And you could remember, beloved, after that incident, God, uh, maybe I'm, I shouldn't say this, but I, I'll say it anyhow, God had no problem. <laughs> Again, in when adverse circumstances arose, remembering what came out of his mouth. My covenant will I not break nor alter the thing that goes out of my mouth. Thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. 
Jesus declared heaven and earth could pass away, but one jot or one tittle of my word will not pass away until everything is fulfilled. And God wants us to understand that. He wants us to know that, beloved, that it may seem when the gloom comes, when the circumstances come, they can't understand. What do you do? How do you respond when such things come? Number one, recall your humanity. Remember you're human. Remember that you are what? Human. You need to remember that if God says so in verses 10 to 12 of Psalm 77. So what caused us to question God? Our humanity. And let me make a word here for, you, for us. Don't you forget that you are human. I, I mean by that, the devil will tell you that you have lost your touch with God because you allow doubt. You allow uncertainty to enter into your spirit. That is not true. The psalmist went on to say that the only reason why I'm asking the question between verses 10 and 12 is because of my humanity. Let me read one verse for you as an, as an example. Psalm 77, and I think verse 12. Okay, take verse 10. And I said, this is my what? Infirmity. But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. In our words, when... The enemy comes in to bring doubt and to attack my faith in God. I will not panic. I will remember that is my humanity. But my humanity does not control me. I will remember the works of the hand of God. And by remembering I actually push back and push out the humanity that come to take or come to try to take the place of God in my life. You know why this is so important? Sometimes to, the thoughts come to you and Satan tells you, if you are really a man of God, if you are really a servant of God, those thoughts will never come into your mind. Tell him he's a liar. You know, there's no one of us whom Satan will not tempt. Not one. He told Jesus, if you are God's son, prove it. He tried to get the Lord to question his sonship. If you are God's son, do so and so. Prove it to me. But if you understand and know who you are, you ain't going to prove nothing to Satan. You take your stand upon the word of God. So number one, you remember your humanity. Like we just talked about David there. Then you take what I call, I call it a counter stance. You, 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 you counteract whatever the devil is bringing into your mind. Secondly, you recall the works of God. And thirdly, you make positive confession. Number one, again, you recognize your humanity. Number two, you recall the works of God. And number three, you make positive confession. There's all of the way for us to counteract what the devil does. But in spite of what he does, 
you take your stand. For God will not forget to be merciful. God will not forget to be faithful. God will not forget. So Christmas tells us that God remembers. <laughs> it matters not how long it takes. God remembers and keeps his word. In the books of Micah chapter 5, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Isaiah chapter 9, well, I'm calling those verses like that. For example, God told the people of Israel, Moses was talking to them, he said, A prophet will the Lord your God raise up like unto me, him will you hear, and the people shall be gathered unto him. That prophet was the Lord Jesus Christ. We know quite well Isaiah 9, unto us a child is born, unto us the son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. He needs to be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the rule of his kingdom, there shall be no end. And I'm taking a little verse here that belongs to next week's sermon. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. <laughs> God will make it happen. Then Micah chapter 5. That speak about a, a seed coming from the branch of, of Jesse. And the Lord giver shall not depart from on the feet until whom Shiloh comes. So we have God ever so often reminding the people that he has not forgotten. That the purpose, I have not forgotten. The prophet will come. Shiloh will come. The child will be born. And out of Bethlehem, the house of bread, he will be born. So God ever so often is reminding them, is reminding them, is reminding them, what stands should we therefore take in the meantime? Be patient. Be patient. I, I just feel in my heart that song is welling up. I don't know if Bernard knows it. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along where the waters cool bear the weary one's feet. God leads his dear children along. Some through the water some to the flood, some to the fire, but all to the blood. Some through great sorrows, but God gave the sun in the night season and all the day long. When billows roll, when uncertainty comes, when the answers don't seem to come for God's sake, put your feet down, take your stand. Take your stand and say like Job, if though he slay me, I will trust him. You know why? Because I know my Redeemer lives. Beloved, we are on the winning side. We can't lose. We will not lose. God has not forgotten us. He will keep his word. Can we all stand please?